All right, so I don't know if everybody is there. Should we start? Yes. So everyone is here. We had the coffee break. Uh, so there was a coffee break on Slack. Yes. Okay. Good. So now let's talk about we talk about free the propagation in the vacuum of a linearized level. Uh, now let's go to talk about the interaction with test masses and talk about frames. So detectors, we idealize them as test masses. Um, and we, we need to, to, uh, to think about frames because we always detect uh, any observation in the reference frame. We know the physics is invariant on the ratios of reference frame, but we need to avoid frames because we are making detections. So we saw that gravitational waves are very simple in the TT gauge. So uh, now this TT gauge corresponds to a specific reference frame. Um, the detectors is, however, not written in the reference frame corresponding to TT gauge. It's, in, it's intuitive in another frame, the detector proper frame. So we need to switch between these two frames. And uh, since we want to understand uh, the gauge invariant information, it's useful to think about the geodesic deviation equation to, to extract the gauge invariant um, information. So first, for frames, uh, there is a special one, which is called a local, local inertial frame. So it's always possible to choose coordinates such that the Christoffel symbols vanish at one point. So the resulting coordinate system around that point is called a local inertial frame. And in fact, we can do more. It's always possible to choose coordinates so that on an entire time-like geodesic, all Christopher symbols vanish. And for each point in this frame, the geodesic equation, uh, since the Christopher symbol vanish, uh, where well, they become this equation, the second derivative, the, the, the Christopher part is zero. So in this frame, a test mass is 3D folding. Uh, so that's the, the realization of the equivalence principle within uh, Lorentzian uh, geometry. An example uh, that uses uh, such frames is the LISA, the LISA Interferometer Space Antenna, which will be launched in 2030-34. So you have, you have three uh, drag-free satellites. So you have uh, spacecrafts, uh, that adjust their position with thrusters um, to, to, um, to remain centered about a 3D floating mass, which is in the center of the spacecraft. And this, uh, free cent this, these centers are freely falling. And, um, and then the idea is to measure their, the distance between this freely falling frame, uh, which will be due to the gravitational waves. Um, once you have a freely falling frame, um, well, we can describe around the geodesic the Christopher symbol goes to zero, but then we, what about the orthogonal directions um, going towards outside of the geodesic? Um, so the, the freely falling frame um, defines uh, defined just the, the system uh, of the test mass, and we imagine that it's at located at special position zero. Uh, and we can uh, add, add some um, three, three uh, different um, vectors to complete the tetrad. Um, and uh, since the Christopher symbols are zero on the geodesic, in any such choice, there will be no um, linear term in the deviation of the metric xi. There will be quadratic terms. Um, and if you expand around the, around the, the, the location, of that uh, freely falling frame, um, you arrive to a metric which looks like this when the deviations x is very small. So I'm not going to prove this, uh, but it contains uh, terms proportional to the second, um, well, uh, to x squared, and it has to be proportional to the Riemann tensor um, because it's, a, it's the derivative of the, the Christopher that we sum into the Riemann tensor. Um, now let's, let's think about the geodesic deviation. For that, let's remember the geodesic equation. So if you have a curve, 
um, the interval between two points uh, separated by a small uh, proper time interval between this, well, or any time uh, parameter space on this curve. Um, the, 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 this, the interval is given by the metric contracted with the, the line element. Uh, so uh, if you penetrate with any lambda uh, in this way, uh, and you define the velocity as a change of the coordinate with respect to lambda, um, it's time-like for a time-like geodesic. There's, uh, there's a minus sign defined uh, the proper time here times, uh, so this is a length squared. So you put a velocity of light to get a time. Uh, so this is the line element. So if you use the proper time, um, the, the velocity is normalized canonically to minus c squared. So the classical trajectory is obtained by extremizing the action, which is this action. And you saw probably in your GR class that if you extremize that action, uh, you obtain the geodesic equation. Now, um, if I have a geodesic with proper time tau, um, and I look at some uh, vector on that geodesic, we can introduce the covariant derivative along the curve, which is the, the partial derivative with respect to time tau, plus the, the connection using the, the Christopher symbols, the velocity and the, the vector. And this one transforms as a vector. So this is the parallel transport along the curve. You should have seen that in your GR class as well. You can check that this transforms as a vector under general uh, coordinate transformations um, uh, because um, the, this transport is not, uh, does not transfer covariantly. There is a Christopher symbol that occurs and that is exactly compensated by this, this, this term. So that one is really a vector. So now the geodesic deviation. Uh, so if you have two geodesics, uh, and each time parameter with proper time tau. And you imagine there was a deviation vector psi between these two. So, so there was x and there was x plus psi. Uh, if you write down the geodesic equation for uh, this one, x plus psi, so you obey this equation. Now is the deviation is small. So small in the sense that it's negligible with respect to the variation of the gravitational fields. We can expand at first order in psi. So at zeroth order, we get back the geodesic equation for x. So we keep the linear terms. So the first linear term is this one. Then there is the deviation of xi here, this term. And then here, there are two terms, which so there is a factor of two because they are two times the same, with the zeroth order term and the deviation xi term. So this equation is true at first order in xi, in small deviations. Now, from this equation, you can prove the geodesic deviation equation, which is given like this, using the, the, the parallel, this parallel transport. Uh, and to, to prove that, uh, let me do it here. Uh, so you compute the second derivative of uh, xi with respect to this uh, covariant uh, transport. So it's the, the, you first expand it once inside. So you get these two terms. So that's a parallel transport. Um, and then you, you, you um, now use the equation I just derived. Uh, yeah, the equation I just derived is here. So first, first you, you, you act with the second derivative. So we have the second derivative. You first take the partial derivative and you get this term. Then the partial derivative act to, has to act here. Uh, and so the, you get um, terms that are proportional to gamma if you act on something else, on xi or on the velocity, it will be proportional to gamma. And the only remaining term is if you act on the gamma. If you act on the gamma, you, you take a derivative with respect to the coordinates times the velocity, so the derivative of the coordinate with respect to, to tau, and that's really a partial derivative with respect to tau. And so the gamma terms will be added uh, at the end. Uh, this is a standard trick in general relativity. You can write down equations up to gamma terms and then say that by covariance, uh, since you have tensors, all these gamma terms resum into uh, covariant derivatives and Riemann tensors. So um, they are there, but they will be uh, automatically included at the right places at the end. So if it's two, these two derivatives, you have these two terms, 
And we proved already this equation from uh, that I just copy pasted here. So now I use this one to replace the covalent derivative. So sorry of the change of notation. This is a, a covalent derivative. Um, this is a partial derivative with respect to tau. So this one is the same as this one. Huh? It's a derivative with respect to, to tau only. So I replaced it here. Uh, so I get the, this minus this term. I get my, minus this term plus this term. So this term is just a, um, a Christopher symbol that I include here on the right-hand side. Uh, and this in this right hand side here, you see that the two terms are, are uh, depend on two velocities, and xi is in front. And in front, you have two derivatives of uh, the Christopher symbol. So in fact, you recognize this as, as the Riemann tensor plus gamma terms. So at the end, uh, since this is covariant, the gamma terms just recent here, and this is the equation. Okay, so we need that deviation later on. Now, uh, so far we introduced only the freely falling frame. Let's try to understand now what is the TT frame, the frame corresponding to TT gauge. So we consider a test mass, which is uh, initially addressed at uh, initial time. Let's look at the geodesic equation. So um, how does the xi coordinate change? It changes with respect to this right-hand side, right? The gamma i. Uh, and then all the all these terms. But now, since um, the mass is initially addressed, all these terms are zero except uh, the d x zero. So now we look uh, at our um, at our metric in T T gauge. So we look at the metric is Minkowski plus a, a deviation. So this background. Um, this, this Christopher symbol, what is the uh, what is value at linear order? So the, the we expand like we did in the earlier exercise at zeroth order, just in terms of gamma is zero because the derivative acting on uh, eta is zero, just a bunch of zeros and one and minus one. Uh, so at linear order, it only given by this term. So the i zero zero component, since we have here an i, this this is really a delta. Um, and so we get these two terms are the same, and we get this, these two terms with a zero here, zero, zero, right? Because we have a zero, zero here, and minus this one. Now in TT gauge, we saw that the this, this H zero I is zero, and that one we put is zero as well um, for linear perturbations. Once we ignore the gravitational the Newton and potential, just considering the gravitational wave. So it's identically zero. So the um, so in in pure gravitational radiation, in the absence of Newton and potential, the um, acceleration is identically zero. So in TT frame, particles which were at rest before the arrival of the wave remain at rest even after the arrival of the wave. That's very um, well. That's, it sounds weird at first. Uh, because the wave uh, has to move masses. But in fact, in this case, the coordinates stretch themselves so that the position of the free test masses do not change. So the effect of the wave is to stretch the coordinates. This is a totally non-intuitive uh, frame. So now we define uh, the the coordinates uh, using freely falling test masses. Sorry, Jeffrey. Yes. Uh, so um, could you go back to the previous slide? Um, so how do we see it from the equations that um, they remain rest at rest? Yeah, it's the equation. So, ah, here, so yeah. the basic equation is telling you that the acceleration is proportional to the velocity squared times gamma i zero zero, yeah. and in TT gauge gamma i zero zero zero. Therefore, the acceleration is zero. Uh, even in the presence of h mu nu. Yeah, even in the presence of gravitational waves. Okay, thank you. So now um, to define this TT frame. Uh, we use the, the freely falling test masses. 
and and therefore we the coordinates on these three falling test masses they will just be stretching along the freely test masses. So we attach them on freely test masses. So that's physically what it means, this TT gauge. Uh, we attach uh, our frame to free test masses and they will not accelerate if they are initially at rest. So that's, a, that's, that's the frame. And what about the time component? So in TT gauge, we have this, uh, all this H component as zero. So the proper time along the time uh, trajectory uh, is given by this formula. That's the standard uh, um, line element uh, where I put the linearized metric here. And so if you have a mass initially at rest, all these terms are zero and the proper time is the coordinate time. So in TT gauge, the proper time of a free test mass initially at rest is the coordinate time. So that defines physically what it means by the TT gauge. So of course the proper distances change. So let's check that. So if you have the distance between two uh, points in this TT frame, uh, we label by uh, two axes, x1 and x2. So the, we saw that the coordinate distance is a constant because uh, nothing moves, but the proper distance is something different. The proper distance is the integral of square root of g uh, xx times dx, right? Is the line element uh, along uh, x direction. So there is a square root of gxx in, in front. So this one we saw uh, is, it does not depend on x. It's totally transverse. It depends only on, uh, on time. So we can uh, put it in front. So it's square root of gx times the distance, the, the length between the two. And so uh, gxx, we saw that it was 1 plus h plus cos omega t, if you have this plane wave. And the square root is, this is very small, so you can approximate it with a one plus one half. So we see that the proper distance changes even though the coordinate distance of TT gauge does not change. So that property that the, the proper distance changes uh, is the basis of interferometry, because if you have two neurons, which are test masses and you send a line beam between the two, the light beam will collect uh, the frequency difference uh, uh, sorry, um, a shift where we have a phase difference um, due to um, the change of uh, proper length that they have to pass through when they move, uh, when they bounce between the two mirrors. So, so far we talked about uh, the TT frame and the free frame frame relevant for Lisa. What about LIGO or Virgo? So frames that are attached to the earth so in Earth, we use distance uh, computed using rigid rulers. And the rigid ruler is something which is based on uh, you know, the, the strong force. It's at a bunch of atoms uh, put together. And, and if, if a gravitational wave passes, the rigid rulers will readjust themselves to get back to their uh, distance set up by the nuclear forces and uh, electromagnetic forces that uh, control them. Um, so so, and also we are attached to the earth. So it's, we are not in free fall. There are two, actually two effects uh, due to the fact we are on earth. There is an acceleration, uh, which is minus the acceleration, the gravitational acceleration of the laboratory. Uh, so we, that prevents us to be on free fall. And there is a local rotation with respect to local gyroscope. The fact that we, our coordinate system rotates. So we need the angular velocity of the laboratory with respect to the local gyroscopes, which are locally uh, uh, freely turning. So these are the two, uh, two effects. So to, to re really explain well, the, the second um, non, um, the second motion, uh, I, will, I will have to think about, um, to talk about the, 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 the particles and the, the test particles. So that will talk only at, uh, only at the end of the lectures. Um, but you can already imagine that there is a, due to the angular uh, velocity of the earth, there is an effect. So uh, this is actually pretty technical to write down the explicit uh, metric with these two effects. So um, it has been done. Uh, and it's uh, also written, it's written in the book of Thorne, who got it from others, I forgot the reference. Uh, but here is the, 
the metric around an observer uh, where x equals zero is, is, is the in initial origin of the, this coordinate system, Earth-based coordinate system. So there are various terms, and each term has, a, has an interpretation. Uh, it's pretty interesting to see what they are. Um, there is an initial acceleration, uh, a redshift. So, so due to the Earth rotation, there is this so-called so -called Sagnac effect, effect uh, and also a Lorentz time dilation due to the rotation. And then the gravitational waves appear here at second order in X due to the curvature. So there are plenty of effects that are competing here to, to measure deviations of, uh, of the standard um, Minkowski metric. So this is the, the detector frame used by experimentalists. Uh, oops. So if we denote the typical variation scale of the metric by LB, um, so, so these acceleration types uh, are, are proportional to, to this length scale. And, and uh, the curvature is, 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 the, is two derivatives, so it's, it's proportional to the square uh, LB, uh, LB minus two. Um, so, so we want to, um, to obtain the effect of the gravitational wave and subtracting the rest. So the interesting uh, point about this metric is that uh, if you now make an expansion in R over LB of the typical variations, uh, typical scales of all these parameters, and you look at um, order R over LB, we find Minkowski. So there is a, a, a sense in which at a zeroth order exists in which you have Minkowski. And then at first order, you have this A term and, 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 and uh, angular velocity term. So you have um, first order effects or Newtonian, which are Newtonian corrections. And then you have high order, like second order effects, which are due to the curvature and then quadratic terms due to Newtonian type effects. Um, so the fact that Minkowski is very different from TT gauge. TT gauge is no expansion in from Minkowski. At zero order is already uh, not Minkowski. But here you have a, an expansion on Minkowski, so you can use um, you can rewrite the geodesic equation and understand the right hand side of the geodesic equation uh, of the acceleration in terms of forces. So in the early detector frame, you can use the intuition of Newtonian gravity by interpreting. Um, gravitational effects uh, as forces. So in this case, uh, the first leading two order effects, uh, so at linear order is the earth gravity and the Coriolis force. So yeah, description in terms of Newton and concept of forces is possible in the earth detector frame. Um, so since we have uh, these gravitational waves are, are subleading, um, as, as I showed you here, um, here, so there are, there are these terms that are quadratic and you have to subtract th these effects of uh, acceleration and angular uh, rotation, and which appear also as second order here, uh, you have um, a cut in the frequencies that you can observe. So I'm not going to explain the details of this, but you have uh, a seismic noise and a Newtonian noise, which are variations of this acceleration and frequencies. And you can uh, analyze where do they occur for, for a seismic activity and for when you, you run a truck or when something uh, train is passing by and it will create perturbations with this kind of frequency range. And I will cut your detect possible detectivity of gravitational waves. Now there are lasers used for um, for the interferometer, and they have a quantum noise, which is at high frequency. So you also have a cut at high frequency due to the laser technology. So the good frequency range for a detector on Earth is in this range between uh, 10 Hertz and uh, 10 to the power of 4 Hertz because of these these. Um, these uh, noise sources. The strain I did not explain yet, but the strain is um, basically the uh, is the metric divided by the square root of the mean 
uh, frequency. Uh, and it's, the typical strain is 10 minus 22. That is detectable. All right. Um, so here is the, that was a cartoon plot. Here is the, the real uh, design, uh, well, the, the real, the real uh, um, uh, what do you call this, the, the, the frequency band, um, the detector frequencies of uh, LIGO uh, and Virgo. Virgo is as a bit uh, lower, uh, lower sensitivity. So there's sensitivity, sorry. Uh, like Virgo has less sensitivity because the arm lengths are only three kilometers, while for Virgo uh, it's four kilometers. Uh, so that's the main difference. And you see that it's between these 10 Hertz and uh, 10 to the power of five Hertz here range. Okay, so all this is very complicated. So this is why um, well, there's some technology here. And since we are, I'm going to do more theory talk, I'm not going to discuss any of this. Uh, but you, what you have to know is that there is the suspenders to compensate for the acceleration. And uh, we will only look at the components of the direction unconstrained by the suspension mechanism. And in, since the, these components are unconstrained, uh, they will be free falling. And so somehow you can forget everything I said. Uh, at the end, it's freely falling uh, in direction orthogonal to the suspenders, and we will forget about all these details. Um, so when you look at the equation for the Josie division at the center of the local initial frame, um, and we take a freely falling frame, um, so this uh, Josie deviation equation uh, is given by this. Um, well, the second derivative now, if we are in the center of a local initial frame, so thinking about orthogonal direction to suspenders, but okay. So this is the, the, the left-hand side. Um, so the right-hand side is given by, by this. We, we have, um, we imagine we, everything is moving in the detector with non-relativistic motion. So the leading term here is the dx0 over d tau. Uh, it's much bigger than uh, the velocities. So that's the leading term. So the geodesic deviation equation is given by, by this, this equation, where this is the wrong one. Well, c squared is c. Um, so this is this equation is a geodesic deviation equation uh, that is valid in any coordinate system. So uh, we can compute the Riemann tensor in any coordinate system, including TT gauge. And we computed it in TT gauge. Um, so it's easy to compute, and you, you, you obtain directly this. this uh, this result here. So now um, that's the, the beauty somehow of it. You can use this equation to describe the, the acceleration inside of your detector frame by using the TD gauge to simplify the Riemann tensor here. Because this equation is uh, coordinate invariant because of the Riemann tensor, you can write it in any gauge. So at the end, in a detector frame, uh, you find this equation. So now, since you can use Newtonian physics intuition, this is uh, with your force. So this is the, you multiply the mass, mass times acceleration is a force. So a uh, gravitational wave creates a force in the, uh, in the earth detector frame given by this formula. And here we, assume, we use Josie deviation equation. So we assume that the, the Josie deviation is very small compared to the length scale of the gravitational wave. And then you, and you can check that he's obeyed for LIGO. So, um, so now that we have this, uh, this equation, we can study the motion of test masses. So we will consider the ring of test masses initially at rest in the detector frame. Uh, so this is for illustration purposes. Huh? It's not the way it works really, but at least we can see the physics of it. So if you have a ring of, of test masses, uh, we fix the origin at the center of the ring. Then the, the, the geodesic deviation xi describes the distance with respect to the origin. Um, so now the, uh, we are in this detector frame, so the coordinate distance is the proper distance. Um, so let's look at the gravitational wave propagating the z direction with the ring in the xy plane to see the effect. 
So the, the TT uh, gauge perturbation, as we saw earlier, is given by this. So it has a trace, uh, uh, it has this, this part here, plus polarization and cross polarization with, a, with some cosine. And uh, the deviation equation now gives you this equation. So you have to compute two derivatives uh, and then uh, solve this equation. Um, I would just use a sign instead of a cos, just by dephasing it, by adding some component in time. But you can always do that just by shifting time, um, just for convenience. Uh, so if the particle is at zero, because of this equation, um, if you start at zero, the, the acceleration will, will remain zero, right? So it will remain there. Um, so the, 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 the Z, uh, all the Z components, moreover, all the Z components are zero here. Uh, so all the, the, the acceleration around all the Z components is Z identically zero. So if you, have, uh, if you are on the plane Z equals zero, you will just remain there. So the, the, the gravitational wave at transverse in their physical effect, they displace the test masses transversely with respect to the direction of propagation. They propagate along the Z direction and will, they will keep the Z equals zero plane intact. They will just uh, act on that plane. They will not uh, shift the Z plane. Um, so if we write the, the, small, the, the deviation as, as a, so something, so deviation starting from X0 and Y0, which are the initial positions. And we imagine small perturbations. Now uh, we plug that into the equation. So the small perturbation is given by the second acceleration, so the acceleration. So uh, this term, we, we need to put XX and XY. So let's look at the, the effect of H plus. Uh, so we take two derivatives of this, we get omega squared coming from here. Uh, times the sin, times the initial position, x0. And then we integrate this two times over time. The omega disappears, and we get the sign. Uh, for x is the same, uh, but now um, uh, we have an extra minus here, because uh, we, had, um, we have a minus here that compensates the the, the minus coming from the derivative of the, the second derivative of the sine. Uh, and then we integrate it twice. Um, and this should be a minus, I guess, with the integration here. So, um, so then uh, it means that these small deviations are given by uh, sine. Uh, so we have this kind of patterns. So after, uh, uh, after an entire period, we go back to the same, but in the intermediately, uh, we have some, uh, some, uh, some uh, well, some axis which changes. Uh, if you do the cross polarization, you will find some polarization like, like this one, this kind of behavior of the test masses. Um, so note that each graph is invariant on the rotation of pi. So if you rotate each graph by pi, you find the same. And that means that gravity has an helicity two. Um, you can see it uh, more precisely. If um, I do uh, a Lorentz transformation, so this is a symmetry of linearized theory. Um, I act with a matrix of Lorentz transformation. Uh, if I take my TTGH uh, metric component here and act with a Lorentz transformation, I will get new, uh, a new polarization. Uh, and since I have H, uh, a lambda on both sides, I will have, uh, they will uh, add up to each other and we give me a cost and sign with two times my initial uh, Lorentz transformation. So if I put these existing together into complex basis, I find this. So this. It means that if you act with a single uh, rotation, you will uh, multiply your, this, this one will be an eigenstate with eigenvalue two. Um, so at, at each time, um, you have um, this eigenvalue two, uh, 
and that's that's the, the definition of uh, LCT two. Just Geoffrey, is there yes. not a I missing in the right hand side of the the equation of the last equation on the bottom right of the page? Ah yes, there's an I missing here. Yes. Just okay. Just to be sure, if I uh, correctly understand. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's an eigenstate, yes. So it has, it has to be proportional to each other. There's an I here missing. So, so it's, here it's clear. Now I just do a rotation. Uh, and you see, because of this structure that it has two components, you, you multiply by, by, by uh, gamma twice huh? on the left and on the right. And then because of the tri trigonometric identity, they, they multi this multiplication go to a cos 2 phi and cos 2 uh, sine two, uh, sorry, cos two phi and sine two phi. And then, then you have this eigenstate with eigenvalue two. So you see that in electromagnetism, uh, you have a gauge potential with only one index and you multiply by gamma only once, and then you have a spin one or electricity one. Here the electricity two comes from the fact that you have the two components, it's a two tensor. And you see it visually here because the, the rotations uh, this is invariant under the rotations of pi. And so this factor of two here is the elicity. Okay. Um, so let's discuss now the, the energy of gravitational waves. So that's a very interesting topic. Um, so it goes back to the work of, uh, of Bondi uh, in 1961. So for um, around uh, 45 years, it was not very clear the gravitational waves were real because it was not clear that they carry uh, energy. But what Bondi showed uh, in a paper on Nature in, in 61 is that they, they can accelerate masses. Um, so it's similar to this argument here that now somehow we are already convinced because of this, this equation. So gravitational waves, accelerate test masses and they have a force given by this. So now this is a proof that gravitational waves are real because uh, they, this is comes with geodesic deviation equation, which is gauge invariant. And we saw that we interpreted the, the in, the, in, in terms of the detector frame, uh, a, an acceleration of test masses and we see that it's non-zero. So, so um, it's this, this kind of argument. Uh, so the accelerate masses. And so according to GR, any form of energy induces a curvature. So since we have a lot of energy uh, that is propagating inside the space time, it should back react. So if we look at beyond linear theory at second order in the expansion in H, we should find that there is curvature generated and that curvature should allow to define energy of gravitational waves. It's important to go to second order because at first order in H, there's no, no notion of energy. Uh, the back reaction comes at second order in age. So let's discuss a bit perturbation theory. So now we have a metric perturbation with a Minkowski first order perturbation, and now we have a second order perturbation plus high orders. We are still assuming that H, a linear order, is numerically less than one in a certain coordinate system. Uh, so this expansion is consistent if this term is much smaller than h. And um, so now in general, um, close to masses that generate gravitational waves, we should put a g bar here and consider h is smaller than one, but and g bar uh, of order one. But we, can, we cannot put eta. In fact, we are going to prove this in a minute. It would be inconsistent to put eta. We have to put a g bar here. Um, so if we have an expansion like this, uh, a natural uh, question is how can you distinguish what is the background and what is the fluctuation? Because you can just, uh, this, is, this is numerically small, but you could say G bar contains actually uh, G bar plus H, you just include it into G bar. So it's totally ambiguous the way you write this. Now to make this unambiguous, we will distinguish the notion of background and perturbation by the frequency content. So the background will be low frequency content and the perturbation will be high frequency. 
So here there, is a, there was an unambiguous notion because this is a fixed eta Minkowski. But that one we will see it's inconsistent. This one is consistent. Uh, and here, we, what we mean by Gragon is low frequency. So, um, yeah. So we consider a situation in which, in some reference frame, we separate the metric into a background plus fluctuation, and we have um, a, a, a cutoff in between the two, which is a typical uh, scale. So that scale, we can have a scale in time or in space. Um, so in space, it will be a, a length, uh, and we consider um, like uh, some like low frequency, uh, low um, sorry, um, low um, low uh, length compared to this length, or we have uh, here we have a frequency based, and this gravitational wave would be uh, for high frequencies. So the gravitational waves here, I should have put this one on the right hand side here. So this um, gravitational waves will have a low um, uh, typical length compared to the background length or a high frequency compared to the background frequency. So here we have a background frequency or, or a typical background frequency or typical length. Okay, so here, in this uh, scenario here, we have two small parameters. We have h, uh, which is the order of this perturbation. So that's a pure number, uh, smaller than one. And then we have the, the ratio, either the frequency ratio or the length ratio. So we have two small parameters. So we now expand exchange equation to quadratic order in h. So these are Einstein's equations that I rewrote slightly because normally it's, it's the Einstein tensor equals stress energy tensor and I remove a trace. So I put the trace on the right-hand side. So it's very simple to do that. Um, and then the trace of the stress energy tensor, I mean, the trace of the ring Ricci tensor is equal to the trace of the uh, stress energy tensor up to a constant. So I'm allowed to, to, to change it. Okay, so now I make my expansion. So this is a function of G. I replace G by G bar plus perturbation at zero order is G bar. And then I have something linear in H and then I have something quadratic in H. So these are one that have contain only low frequency modes, right? Because it depends on G bar. This, this one is this high frequency mode contains in H around this background. Uh, and now if I have H squared, I have both types of modes, basically, because if I have uh, two high frequency modes, they can still mix up to give me a low frequency modes. So here I, I have both types of modes. So if I do, if I now uh, expand this, this uh, substituting um, my expansion, I can write, I can split the equation into the low mode equations and the high mode equations using some kind of projection. Uh, so the low modes, for the low modes, I will have uh, the background and then the low part of R2 and the low part of the stress energy tensor. And for the high modes, I will have R1, the high part of the R2 and the high part of the stress energy tensor. So this low mode equation will give me the energy momentum of gravitational waves. So to, to define this operation of projection more precisely, uh, we introduce an intermediate time scale between the time scale dictated by the, the two uh, frequencies. And we will do an average of our t, t bar. So the average of a t bar uh, is a way to get this low frequency because we will, uh, all these uh, high frequency modes would get uh, average to zero. So we obtain this equation where this is the time average over intermediate time scale. That kind of, a, of, of equation, uh, it was under two in the 60s, it's called a renormalization group flow. So that idea originated from quantum field theory, but it's totally applicable here for the study of gravitational waves. Um, and it's an integration out of high frequency to describe the physics at low frequencies. Um, so now that we have this uh, equation, 
uh, we're going to define the effective stress tensor gravitational wave in this way. Um, so R2 is the trace of, uh, of the second order perturbation where I use a G bar to put the trace. Uh, and, um, and, and this is just a, a definition, um, a, a definition of T. So now the trace of this, if I put G bar, I can put the G bar inside of the, of the, of the average here because it's only low frequency. So it passes through by integration with the high frequencies. Um, and so uh, I have, a, I have uh, the trace here will give me a factor of four. So it gives me a minus two. That one gives me a plus one. So it gives me overall a minus one. That kills a minus one. So I have this one, this plus here. So that's true. Um, so, um, right. So now uh, if I um, write uh, here, uh, yeah, so yeah, so my R2 here, yeah, right. So is this R2 here? Uh, now I can rewrite it this way, just by combining these two equations. Now I simply uh, compute this, this T will cancel that part, right? So now since, since this uh, R2 given by this, I will plug that into this equation now. And you see that these two T naturally add up. Do you see that? So now I plug this equation into this one. So the T naturally add up. So, uh, and the last thing is that this one, an average of this sum, uh, I will just call it, I will just write it down as T bar minus uh, G bar T bar. So it's a, it's a definition of what T bar is. Um, so then this, this term becomes, uh, we can resum it uh, into this equation. So now we have the natural sum of the T bars. Um, and here I wrote it with the T's, with the, the convention of writing R equals something with the T's. Now I, I go back to the convention of writing it in terms of, uh, of R on the left hand side. So yeah, I'm missing, I'm, I'm skipping one step here, but it's using the trace of the equation minus the trace and you get the right hand side, left hand side here. The main point is that we have the sum of the matter uh, averaged over high frequencies and the stretch energy tensor of the gravitational waves, T. So this is a coarse grain form of Einstein's equation of low frequencies. I'm sorry, the, the, do you mean the stress energy tensor of the gravitational waves is, uh, I mean, this uh, from this equation, uh, it seems like it's, it's a relative from the, the perturbations, right? Yes, so it's uh, so I, I didn't prove yet is the energy of the gravitational wave somehow. I just say this, this is the definition. It comes from the second order piece. Uh, it comes from the, the Ricci tensor at second order. And uh, it can and you know in this equation there are also of course higher orders, but that's a bleeding because that's because we make an expansion in small parameters here. Huh? So this equation is true up to sub subleading corrections, but that's the definition so far, it's just defined in terms of R2. But this is a natural equation that arises. Okay. Um, but I'm, uh, I'm confused there, uh, because if uh, if the gravitational wave is, uh, I mean, it's the stress and the tensor, uh, I, I, I think it should uh, uh, relate it to, to the perturbations, but I can't say it here, so, so I'm- uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, so the perturbation is H, huh? Yeah. So it's quadratic in H. Ah, okay, okay, yeah. So it's quadratic in H. Okay, can I ask you? Okay, thank you. Sorry, Geoffrey. Uh, in the same equation, uh, there is also a term R2, which is linear in H2, right? Because you wrote uh, G as um, eta G bar plus H1 plus H2. Uh, yes. So uh, yes, indeed. This R two, um, so it, co it will contain the H two as well, uh, right? Um, yeah. So the R two that contains the H two, um, it's it contains uh, high frequencies. It will be part of this high frequency here. So R two contains two types of terms. You're right. There is the quadratic terms in terms of the original H, and there is also uh, in this expansion there is an H two. So which is also a second order. So there is a linear term in terms of uh, linear terms of H2. 
and that one will contain the will be part of this high frequency part because uh, um, um, yeah you're right um, yeah uh, well actually this this argument still applies so h2 can contain low frequency so it will be applied to both right so it's containing both and Let's so, see how we go. Yeah. Sorry, Geoffrey. I have another question which, which is related. Uh, can you go back uh, on the slide where you defined the H2? And uh, I don't understand uh, really what the difference is in your expansion between H and between H2. Is this uh, like an expansion with a small parameter that is uh, implicit or something, something so? Yes, so H uh, contains a small parameter. H2 is proportional to that small parameter squared. Okay, uh, so, but it's so and it's, a, and it's a perturbative ex ex expansion of Einstein's equation. So H2 obeys the uh, linear equation sourced by the H. Yeah, so, so it's the, the, like the normal the stuff uh, we are doing, okay. Yeah, so Thank this you. one obeys linearized equations. That one obeys linearized equation sourced by some quadratic terms proportional to this one yeah okay thanks i i also yeah. have a question so um how um, uh, the stress energy tensor of the gravitational waves that we have just defined how is it um, related or is it consistent with other formulations like uh, the hamiltonian formulation of GR in the brown york strand tensor or uh, with the uh, covariant phase space formalism that we are learning in the other GR course? Yes. Is it, uh, do they coincide at disorder in perturbation theory? I imagine so. But... Um, it's a very good question. And I don't know the, the general answer actually. Um, actually, uh, I don't know the general answer. They, um, so two of these methods, Hamiltonian and common phase space methods are based on, um, on killing vectors or asymptotic killing vectors, and they are associated with charge to it. Here, the approach is to define a stress tensor um, and um, without uh, the necessity to define any uh, forms of vector, but, but the vectors are there somehow because we, yeah, um, here, well, here, the thing is that the, this background doesn't need to have any symmetries. Hmm. Uh, so it's perturbation theory around a generic background. So that background a priori has no symmetries at all. And here we are defining something, uh, a stress energy tensor uh, on, with some, uh, which is a non-local type of uh, quantity because it's defined with, uh, with this operation of uh, integration of a high frequency. So it's a non-local uh, definition, uh, and it, there's no symmetry. There's a um, there's a more general construction. So I don't know if there is a way to to relate them easily. Yeah, but is this um, is the stress tensor of gravitational waves covariantly conserved? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I'm coming to that. Okay. So if you look at this equation, if you look at this equation, uh, that's the equation we derived here. I mean, I, I'm, 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 I'm did a bit fast by skipping some derivatives here, uh, some uh, some trace here, but you can you yeah. Can if you that. do the divergence, you, you take the cover divergence with respect to the background metric. The left hand side is zero by Bianchi identity, and therefore the right hand side is um, uh, also has to be divergence free. So the sum of the two is. Uh, the total stress energy tensor is conserved. Yeah, and the and the um, T bar is the matter, so it's conserved independently. Um, yes, um, I think they are both conserved independently. That's right. That's right. So uh, yeah, at any place where there's no matter, this T is zero, and you have the conservation just outside. Uh, once you don't have matter, certainly, and if you have the matter. Um, 
Well, you have to think a bit more. I think the sum really is conserved because the it depends on the on G. Yeah? Both of them depend on G. Mm -hmm. So for the matter, I would say that the sum still is okay. mature independently. Sorry, the derivative that kills, I mean, the left hand side is uh, with respect to the G bar, right? Right, with respect to G bar. So, so the stress ensure is conserved with respect to G. That's, so, but here uh, it's a D with respect to G bar. And right. that kills the, the sum of the two. And it kills uh, the T bar individually, is it? I think. No, it's no, it is the sum really. The, it's really the sum. But in, in the usual Einstein's equation, uh, both sides are divergence free. Uh, yeah, that's right. But here, the t-bar is, t is defined by this separation. Huh? Okay. So here, you did something that you don't do usually. You did a high frequency, uh, you know, this t-bar is, is like a subset of your t. I mean, some local non-local definition of your t, which is given by a, a, an integral over all high frequencies of this quantity t. So, okay. you know, if you take a derivative, this is not a local field like it was before. Huh? Okay, okay. That's the difference. So, um, yeah. This is a, a non-trivial conceptual step to do this, uh, this separation of frequencies and to, 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 to create this... Uh, this, this very simple looking expression, which uh, actually, if you want to write it down explicitly in general, uh, it's not trivial at all. Huh? What do you mean by that? Uh, in general. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, and here you, you see uh, something very weird if you do perturbation theory, because the left hand side is a zeroth order expression in this perturbation H, the right hand side is certain order in H. So uh, usually it's not allowed to do that, to equate a zeroth order with a second order expression in point of perturbation theory. But here it's possible because there are two small parameters. Okay. Okay. So here is the explicit expression for uh, R1 and R2. Uh, so uh, this is an exercise to derive them, but it's too long to derive them. Um, right, so now uh, let's analyze this equation to try to understand it. Um, so if we choose coordinates such that the background metric is order one, um, and um, when we have some variations, uh, of the background metric, we, we, we will get the, the typical length scale of the background uh, length scale, which, which is the typical length scale for, this, for these derivatives. That's, the, that's what we actually meant by LB. Um, so R it contains two derivatives. So it will be order one of LB squared. Um, now, uh, for, to understand the right-hand side, so when we take a derivative of H, we have the H is of order H, which is a small parameter typical of the, the, the perturbation. And then we take a derivative, we get this length scale typical of the high frequency range. So, um, so the R2 here, which you see here, it depends on two derivatives, two background derivatives acting on H. Uh, and you see uh, all the terms are like this. Huh? Uh, they all have different index structure, but that two H is two derivatives in all cases. So it's two derivatives uh, on, and two h's. So it's a squared divided by uh, this i frequency type um, uh, length. This, this length is squared. Okay, so Einstein's equation now tells you that these two things are equal. So one of this length scale equals this length scale plus the matter that is the input yet. So if there's no matter, uh, h has to be given by this one. So you see now that these two small parameters have to be commensurate, uh, have to be around the same. And if you have matter, uh, if the matter dominates your uh, this term, so if the matter dominates, uh, it means that this term uh, is smaller than, L, than this term, so because that matter dominates. So that one is smaller than matter, which means smaller than this one. So if matter dominates, you have this, which means H is less than this. Okay, so 
if you have matter or no matter, uh, in both cases, H is smaller or equal to this type of uh, scale. So now we come to the point that if we uh, ignore the background, low frequency background, uh, so if we take push this nice scale to infinity by ignoring that you have uh, variations of the background, so that pushing LB to infinity, it means that we are describing an H which is uh, around zero or less than, uh, than zero. So we are actually breaking the perturbation theory. So that's the justification for saying that um, this expansion is, is, uh, uh, is not consistent. We need to have a perturbation that includes some background uh, perturbation, LG bar. Otherwise, we run into that problem. Um, we need to have this equality. OK, that's, that's a very subtle point. Um, now, if you are very far away from the sources, um, you can assume that this is true. Uh, it's not true when you are close to the sources, but you are far from the sources, it's true. So in, if you are far from the sources, um, from the stress energy tensor here, uh, that I wrote down uh, somewhere here. OK, this is a T, T mu nu, is given by this expression. So it's given by this. Um, so we want to now compute it uh, far from the sources. And we want to compute it in harmonic gauge and to simplify our lives also in H equals zero gauge. So um, now let's try to compute this. Um, and I will give you one tool, very useful tool uh, to compute this uh, because there is this average and we need, a, we need to think about what it implies. So if you have an harmonic gauge, a perturbation is a superposition of plane waves, like we, we uh, like I, I derived in the first, uh, first part. So we have some polarization and some, some wave like this, and we have an infinite sum of such things. So I will put that with, a, with an integral. We have a, a sum of these things. Uh, so if we take a time derivative of it, of a single plane wave, we have we find i omega. If we have the i derivative, it will reach it will it will hit this this x here. So we will get uh, minus i omega over c and i, which is the unit normal, which is the direction of propagation of that plane wave. So it means that if you took at these two equations, the i of i h is actually proportional to the t of h with the n i factor minus one of the CNI factor. OK, let's keep that in mind. So now, if in, inside of these uh, time integrals, of this um, yeah, integral over, 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 over uh, high frequency, this total, total t derivative drop because of time average. Because we integrate something over high frequencies, we integrate over times uh, as between some, with some initial, final initial uh, times which are periods uh, of, uh, of the oscillations. And so this time, this total time derivative just drop. Now the di, total di derivative, actually because of this property, you can rewrite them as t derivatives and this t you can put it in front. So if you have a total di derivative of some harmonic function, you can rewrite it as a dt because of, of the wave property of these uh, harmonics. And then it will drop as well. So in conclusion, for any stress energy, well, for any, sorry, not stress energy, for any tensor with three indices here and any types of uh, summation here, this is zero, both for T and for I, as long as T is comprised of, um, of uh, waves because of the property of waves. So this is the interesting trick. And this is a covariant. Uh, expression at the end. So you can any covariant derivative, um, sorry, not covariant, uh, total derivative. I mean, with respect to any alpha, that's why I mean, any T or I, it's, it drops. So here is the exercise. Um, here's the formula for R2, which is hard to prove, but okay, some algebra. So, but here it is given to you. 
Now you assume you are outside the source and you assume you are around Miskowski and you assume you have a perturbation which is in harmonic gauge and trace, trace free, so harmonic, trace zero and uh, this one, the transverse. Uh, and you can use this property and try to prove that the average uh, R2 is zero and the average R2 with these indices is given by this. So I'll give you a couple of minutes. Can I ask a question? Yes. This first assumption, it's a G bar or G. Oh, yes, it's a G bar here. Okay, yeah. good, thank you.
All right. Do you need more time? So let me give you some, um, some hints here. So the first thing to notice, this term is identically zero because uh, once you contract with rho sigma, here you have the trace, we, we, this trace is zero, and here you have the divergence. So this term you can just forget about it. When you compute the divergence, um, here you also see uh, all directly a lot of terms are, are vanishing. So here, this term uh, is there. Uh, so you have the one half, uh, so the whole factor one half, which is keep. So this one, um, the H is contracted. So we have a one half factor here. And uh, you also have a such term here. Um, such term is here too. So in total it's three half uh, minus this one. The other one is with the mixed uh, type uh, structure. And then here, um, this divergence, this, this one is a, is a box really, because you contract mu and u. So it's actually somewhat is harmonic. So this is just zero. Here you have a trace, so you find it's zero. And here you have a divergence. And here also um, you have a divergence and a divergence, so it's zero. So this harmonic term is just zero, I just put it there, but then the, they're actually all zero because you can integrate by parts. You have a total D derivative, and then you, you integrate by parts and you find the harmonic condition. Same with this one, you integrate by parts and you find divergence, D alpha of H alpha here. So they're all zero. And for R, um, well, I'll just reward all the terms you have, but then uh, again, um, you do integration by parts, you find here this d alpha, they combine then, it's a harmonic. Uh, here, the d alpha becomes a transverse condition. Uh, this one, um, uh, you integrate this, this d alpha in that side, you find transverse condition. That's the same for that one, same for that one. So at the end, you only have, are left with these two. Uh, these two terms, uh, and you integrate by parts in this one. You get a minus one, one uh, minus one. With this one half minus one, it gives you minus one half, so minus one quarter. Okay, I hope you all, all got it. So finally, yeah. So we have this property. So we're going to use this in minutes now. Okay. So the energy momentum tensor, which was given by this, by this. So now this term is zero, and that one we just saw what it was uh, with, the, with this minus one half. The minus gets, gets here, so we have plus thirty-two over uh, pi j. The question is: Do residual gauge transformation change this stress tensor? Um, so let's check. We have. Um, the, the residual gauge transformation um, is the transformation of the linearized metric. So it's given by, uh, by this, this, this um, expression in linearized theory on uh, Minkowski. The question is, do they change uh, t? So I can try to see if it changes or not. Uh, so that's a new exercise. And you should prove that it does not change. So that is a good observable. So I'll let you work on it a couple of minutes as well.
All right, it was not that difficult. So let's do it. So remember, the we are working with a trace already zero. So this Xi cannot change the trace. So the divergence has to be zero. And we are working with trace transverse H. So if you look at transverse condition here, uh, so you have a box Xi plus here you have you find again the trace of, of uh, the divergence of Xi, which is just zero from here. So the H is transverse and uh, harmonic. So uh, so inside, so once this is, this is it's harmonic, um, you are allowed to use the fact that you can drop total derivatives because inside inside you have harmonic functions, you have functions of H and Xi, which are both harmonic. Uh, so the derivative with respect to uh, I. You can convert in derivative in respect to t, uh, and they average to zero. So you are allowed to use this property. So then you it's just a matter of computing this. So there are two terms, but the two of them are similar, just with mu inverted with uh, mu. So this just look at the first term. So you act on the h, so you get this one. Um, so the two terms are the same because uh, this is symmetric. So it's just one term. So uh, now you integrate by parts uh, the alpha, uh, and you are allowed to do it because of the harmonicity condition. And you integrate by alpha, and now this one is transverse. So it's zero. Is that clear? Okay, so it's invariant under the residual transformations, residual gauge transformations. Okay, so answer here is no. So uh, since uh, we uh, were gauge invariant in uh, well, from transverse towards TT gauge, um, we can gauge fixed to T gauge now. We know we're not going to change anything. So um, the effective stress energy density. Uh, the zero zero component uh, which is with time derivatives here with two minus signs that cancel out because I put the index up um, but there are two of them so it's a dot dot and then uh, there are only ij components here so and this is a matrix uh, you know uh, two by two matrix so you just uh, square it you find this one right uh, there is a factor of two uh, because they are it's the by two by two matrix that you square. Um, so you get this 16 of pi j here. Uh, so the derivative is a t derivative. So it's a c times the derivative vector to x zero. Right. Okay, so here we go. We come to the question that was asked. So the bankality imply this com com complete conservation with respect to the background. Uh, metric G. Um, and therefore, we can associate to a uh, point pre symmetry um, a conserved quantity. So, since we are looking at uh, far from the sources where we use this background, is effectively Minkowski. Um, so, uh, so, far from the sources, um, the, there is no T, and this covariant derivative becomes a derivative normal derivative. So this is a standard story on a given volume. So uh, you have this equality. Um, so uh, we can define the effective energy of the volume to be this one. And it obeys uh, a flux balance law. The time derivative of it, which is, which is d0 here, is one of the c dt, is given by the right-hand side, which is a, um, a surface type integral of the 0i component. So let's take a surface, which is a spherical surface. So the, 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 line, the area element is R squared d omega. So the change of the energy in a given volume is given by the T0R component. Um, and so it's this one. So unit normal now is along the R direction with the minus sign and with the R squared here. Um, 
So D0, we, we put its value here. Uh, so it was one over 16, which is here. C squared, 16, etc. Uh, ah, that's the energy, sorry. That's the zero, zero component. I want the zero I component. So I have to use this one. So with the D0 and the I here, with the 32 here and C4. So it's this one, the C4. Um, uh, this is D0, et cetera. Uh, so, so that term is given by this. Um, so again, we have uh, now, now um, now we want to understand this, but uh, we want to understand it for realistic sources now, not for plane waves. So um, at large distances, we don't have um, plane waves if we look at the, the entire integral or, or around the source. Uh, instead, the gravitational waves propagate radially outwards. So uh, a good uh, asymptotic behavior for large radius around the source is this one. So this is uh, similar to electromagnetic waves. So it's, um, so it's the one over R times the function of retarded time. Um, so let's just check that this is indeed. Um, Sorry, good, Jeffrey. Uh, yes. Can, can you go back to the, what happened to this R squared in the first line? Uh, yeah, so the T, uh, yeah, this equality, equality is just for T zero R. I didn't do yet the, that operation. I mean, uh, there is an R squared in the first line, yeah. but disappeared. Yeah, this, yeah that's one is, uh, that's one is one of R. So there's all one of R squared that would kill these R squared so that the final result it will be finite at the end. But so uh, this, this uh, H is proportional to one of R times some function of retarded time. Yeah, but so, you have not yet expanded HTT in terms of F. No, no, I did not, no. And here, I did, this equality is not the equality, this one. This equality is just the T. Uh, ah, the inside, okay. Just the T zero R component. Ah, I see, I see. So, okay. so I should put some kind of brackets here. Okay, yes. thank you. Uh, so this is, so this is the right behavior up to all the R's. R's, R's R minus two. It's not totally obvious uh, that plane waves resume to this when you have a spherical wave, but you have to study a bit spherical wave. See that it is a spherical wave. Uh, we can just check that it obeys this. Um, so the the proof is not that difficult. Um, I'll give you a minute to check it.
All right, so let's not spend too much time on it. There are two ways to compute this. Either you compute it in Cartesian type coordinates or in retarded coordinates. I like to compute in retarded coordinates. So the harmonic, the, the, the down motion, uh, the best way to write it is this way. Uh, so you have a derivative, current derivative of vector. So current derivative of vector, you can always rewrite it with the, the trick of writing with the square, square root of the determinant with a normal derivative. And this vector, you have an inverse metric. Um, so in either you use uh, standard spherical coordinates, which is given by these ones, or you use the retarded one. In both cases, the square root of the determinant is just C. So, um, so you, you can just drop it when you compute it. Uh, so for inverse metric, it's used UR coordinates. So the inverse of UR, so you have to invert that metric, is that one. Uh, so you first have to compute this vector here. So you replace the, the field, scalar field here, phi by F i j divided by R. And uh, this derivative, the point is that in this retarded coordinate, you don't have the, um, you have a zero here. So when you will compute for the U component, you have to compute the radial derivative. So you have a one over R square here. Um, and here, um, well, you have the minus one du, uh, and then the dr here. And now if you compute the divergence, uh, where well, you have du of the first term, so you have one over R squared, and then you have the dr of the second term. So this one will be hit again by dr. So at the end is R minus two. Okay. Okay, so it's, it's, it's harmonic, it's a good um, up to this order that we are looking at. So let's now compute the radial derivative of this H. Uh, so H is given by this, huh? so one of R F times this retarded time. So we compute the radial derivative. So we have a one of R squared times F, uh, which is negligible. And then uh, the radial will hit inside here. So we have a T derivative times minus one over C. So this fact, this is in fact exactly the same as uh, at minus d zero times h t t because we recognize one of the r f here. So or d zero in the numerator here, plus uh, this r squared or the r squared term that we neglect. Huh? So it means that the t zero r is the same as t zero zero in fact because of this property. We should derive with respect to r is the same as zero with respect to r zero. Um, so that's, um, so let's, with the exercise, we don't see this anymore. So this RDR here, I replace it with a D0 now, right? And now we have to do this integral. Um, so instead of doing the integral, we can just look at the energy with respect to uh, a unit area here. So the one of the R squared cancels, cancels. Here, the R squared cancel the one of the R and one of the R here. Uh, we are just left with minus uh, minus C's and these, these factors. And now instead of doing the integral, I would just put it on the left hand side saying that this, this is the change of energy per unit area. So I just have um, the same formula as the, as the C here. Okay, so I hope all the factors are right. I, you, I don't think you can follow from a, me switching between slides, you can check that later on. But it give you that, that formula. And if you plug in the explicitly, you have this. So this is the energy um, flux per unit area due to the two polarization of gravitational waves. It's a very neat formula because you find just this h plus and h cross squared. Um, so that was obtained by Einstein, but then uh, it was corrected by Eddington because it was a wrong factor of two. So now um, this is a bit related to the question earlier with covariance phase space, but here uh, for each vector of Minkowski, you have a conserved current because uh, uh, you can build that conserved current from this stress energy sensor uh, for each background, uh, each vector field of the background. So you can do uh, a flux balance law for momentum, for example, if you take the momentum, 
and then you all these first band slows are, have been written down. So these are the first band slows for all the, the point correct charges for the for the, the rotation you have the angular momentum, and then for the boost you have the center of mass. So these are the first band slows for point correct charges. And I cannot resist to mention you that there is more because I told you the, the original work on this uh, gravitational radiation was done by Bondi in the 60s. And they, they had a very nice approach uh, to study the asymptotic fields close to non infinity, uh, assuming that you have an isolated source and that you, have, you are stationary in the far past. And the, the, the best way to write this down now. Um, is to well, do the Penrose into the Penrose diagrams where you can see all the asymptotic structure of space time in a single piece of paper. Uh, I think you had lectures of this in your GIA class, um, probably. Huh? So you saw this Penrose diagram of Minkowski or black hole collapse. Uh, so around null uh, infinity, you can write down more uh, flux balance laws. So I think you also had um, classes on, on BMS symmetry. GR class, I don't know if uh, it was done this year. Can someone confirm? Uh, did you study BMS symmetry already? No, or at least not yet. No, not yet. Okay. Well, so I can just show you two slides on this to finish the session. Um, so if you, um, you can write down, you can write a certain gauge. Um, it's called Newman Unti gauge. So you 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 define uh, you define null a null coordinate u, and uh, you define a radius uh, which are section on these lines um, on this uh, congruence of null uh, null lines that go to towards uh, sky. So and you can write down an asymptotic solution in these coordinates. Uh, and at leading order is Minkowski, and then you have subleading terms. Uh, and so the, that metric can be written down consistently uh, to all orders in the radius. Uh, and that was, was done by, uh, by Bondi, uh, Bondi, Sachs, uh, Vandenberg, and Messner in the 60s. Um, if if uh, at leading order you have uh, two quantities and the, the leading one is this, this one, the Bondi, it's called the, the Bondi shear, uh, and it contains, it's unconstrained for Einstein's equations. And then all the rest is constrained by Einstein's equations. You have all the rest of the metric that you expand is constrained. Only these ones are unconstrained, and they represent the gravitational radiation. Uh, and the rest is unconstrained and can be written as, as retarded uh, some integrals. Okay, and then you can write down these fluxes. Um, since you have um, you have uh, all the ancient equations are algebraic, um, except for uh, uh, some uh, well, an infinite set of um, ordinary differential equations, um, you can write down this explicitly uh, algebraically, uh, except for um, a bunch of uh, quantities that are special in Bondi gauge or in this Newman Unti gauge. And these quantities uh, obey a differential equation with respect to u to retard the time. So you can write them at integral over u of some algebraic expressions. And the fact that you have these um, quantities that obey differential equations, it's natural to write down um, uh, conserved quantities associated to, to each of them. And the ancient equation will give you an equation like this, like uh, flux balance laws for all of them. So these generalize the point query uh, flux balance laws, but only at infinity. And it's not clear if there is any local uh, version of these flux balance laws in the in the bulk of space time, like they are for the point query balance laws. Um, okay, but that's more advanced. I just wanted to to mention this. Uh, so that ends the class for uh, for today. Um, and uh, tomorrow we will restart with the generation of gravitational waves. Do you have more questions?
I, I will stay here for a couple of more minutes if you have more questions. But um, see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.